Now for the final presentation in this part of the session, we have Betty. Betty is an author of Games and Gamification in Market Research, and she will be drawing on extensive experience in gamification to discuss the metaverse and the impact for the data collection and participant engagement. What have we learned? What can we transfer? What should we avoid? So welcome, Betty. Hello, everybody. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm an Associate Talent Director at Henlelius Recruitment and author of Games and Gamification in Market Research. And I'm so privileged to be invited here today to speak at this event and to be part of the ASC conference. I think there's some people that I know here who have perhaps seen me kind of grow up around conferences. Um, and ASC has always kind of had a special place in my heart. So it's really nice to be here today. It was my birthday last week, and uh, thank you. <laughs> and um, on the day of my birthday, my old boss, Eric Van Velzen, who many of you will know as the co-founder of Nebu, sent me this photo, just as a reminder of another time where we were celebrating together. And here we are in Las Vegas. And many of our team were there together. It was a small team, but a few of us were there. Andrew used to work at Nebu at the time, who's in the front row. He was in Ohio at the time. And I share this picture because it was taken the day after my first ever talk on gamification in market research. So this time really kind of holds, well, the time in this picture really holds quite a kind of important marker in my career, but perhaps even in gamification research more broadly. So this was the conference. It was CASRO. Many of you may remember CASRO. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, and I spoke then about avatar-based research games. I spoke about place bondance. I spoke about using augment augmented reality-based research games engaging gamified systems in which data can be collected about what participants think and feel and what they might do. And that was taken 12 years ago. And there was a lot of celebration around this new idea. There was a standing ovation at that conference presentation, which really took me by surprise. And I couldn't believe the amount of press and publicity from marketing and market research about this new concept of gamification and using virtual worlds in research and what it could do for consumer insight. But what's happened since then? And what's happened with gamification? I was talking about the need at the time for engaging participants in research. Participant engagement was then and still is now an issue. And I was also talking about context-driven research, having an online qualitative element to our research. And so, as many of you know, the paper then was called The Future of Research Through Gaming, which informed the name of a business I had for 11 years called Research Through Gaming. And so, Running that agency for 11 glorious, exhausting, wonderful, rewarding, tiring years was that I saw tr the trend that brands were interested in these engaging, conceptual, contextual research games. I would build and design research games directly for Fortune 500 brands. But that request didn't come from agencies. Agencies wanted to know, what is gamification? Let me hire you for consultation, run a workshop with us. But the desire for that innovation was coming directly from brands. And in that 12 years, we've also seen that there's been a lot of exploration in the methods of using gamification for participant engagement and contextualizing the research experience but not a lot of commercial doing and adaptation. I think I can probably count on one hand how many businesses in market research are using innovative methods like gamification quite regularly. And still the subject of gamification to many people feels elusive. There might be some people in the room who are like, yeah, I get what gamification is, but some people are like, I still don't really understand, and that's okay. 
And now being in the very privileged position of seeing the market research industry from a recruitment point of view, I can share that less than 5% of the job descriptions that I've seen in a short space of time are asking for candidates who have experience and interest in innovative research methods. And that might include things like gamification or storytelling. So not a lot of commercial adoption, despite all of that excitement and all of that interest. So things starting to feel like they're repeating now. Because at the time, I was talking about augmented reality. At the time, we were talking about different games that were utilizing those technologies and what it could do for insight. But we still have an engagement problem. And on the flip side, Meta's metaverse and lots of these other metaverses promise immersion. In fact, on the way here from Suffolk, making the pilgrimage to the Oval, I was at Liverpool Street Station and there's a big billboard about immersion in the metaverse with education. But as many of us know, immersion doesn't come from just technology. Immersion comes from good design that inspires and motivates and engages so when I have used the metaverse on my husband's account, which I think says a lot about the erosion of my trust with some of these organizations, you're just there, right? Where's the gamification architecture to engage me in exploring and doing? Because it's only a matter of time before some of the novelty of technology wears off. And I'm not the only one who understands the power of gamification to engage and to learn about behaviors. In fact, there is not one industry on the planet right now that is not using gamification in one way, shape, or form. And in fact, if many of you open up your wallets and purses, you will see that you are carrying with you everyday examples of gamification. Doing tasks in exchange for rewards where there are rules and feedback systems. And so where have we seen gamification, just as a few examples? In dieting in learning languages, in the way that we go shopping. Organizations like Tesco's have gone as far to give us money off our shopping bill if we're using their gamified platform of the Tesco club card. Now, many of you will remember that a lot of these kind of reward cards were paper-based. There's a Cafe Nero example there, get nine stamps, get a coffee for free. So why have a lot of those become cards? Why have a lot of those become apps? because we can take data from how people interact with these gamified systems. And so as a result, gamification and data have become synonymous with each other. And so Duolingo, how you learn languages, um, as well as things like fitness apps, Noom, Couch to 5K, all of these things use game elements to engage us and change our behaviors. And so I started using gamification for research. I would gamify surveys. And I was able to do so largely using the survey software systems that are around today. So one of the more popular studies that I did that, um, on behalf of the University of Surrey, which ran for four years, was called What Kind of Student Are You? And that was built on Askia and Jerome and colleagues are in the room, um, and Askia was great, customizable. I was able to allow this kind of gamified survey to sit on the system quite comfortably as part of the processes that researchers are used to using. And that was a big thing for me when I started research through gaming in the first place. I didn't want to create an innovation that no one could use. So it sits on survey software, data is collected in the normal way that can be used by researchers in the normal way. But arguably the quality of that data was more reliable and trusted because it derived from highly engaged participants. So we know we can use existing survey software without the metaverse to create participant engagement and context-driven research. And some people have touched on this already, that using the metaverse for research can be seen as cumbersome, you know, sending out headsets and all that. And think of the insurance that you'll need, you know, to cover the cost of sending out all of these things and what if it gets broken or lost by a participant and on the way and all those things. And so there's a cost attached to that. And 
you'd still need people to build relevant contexts within the metaverse to make sense to the research that you're doing. So if that virtual space in the metaverse doesn't exist, you will need somebody in your research team to build that. There's another cost there. And actually using the metaverse won't increase the likelihood for engagement from your participants or indeed useful insight. So I've mentioned the word gamification about a hundred times so far. So what is it and what problems can it solve? So whenever I talk about gamification, I talk about engagement. So gamification is the tool that gives us engagement. And it's not just any kind of engagement. Many of you will know about the differences between extrinsic and intrinsic engagement. Intrinsic engagement is about the joy of doing something just for the purpose of doing it. Now, we extrinsically engage research participants. Do X and you will get a reward. And when people are intrinsically engaged in a task, there's virtually no limit on how much they will focus, collaborate, and create. And that's what we ask of a lot of our participants, right? We want them to focus on what we're asking them, how they're responding. We want them to collaborate and create with us about a new product or service. What do we think about that packaging? What do we think about that logo? That requires collaboration and creativity. But why? What is it about games that is so intrinsically engaging? And so I'm a researcher. I ask why. So I spent some of my career doing a lot of academic research into this space. Now, there's some psychologists in the room that might re recall some of the things on the screen that they've read in, in books of um, days of yore. And there are academics who believe that we've got three psychological needs, you know, mastery, autonomy, purpose, or relatedness, autonomy, and mastery. But, you know, I think that there are four. So this is my, my chart accumulating a lot of research here. And so... All of us, no matter our age or our ethnic background, we all have these four psychological needs. Our need for mastery, so how well we think we're doing at something, how well we're progressing. Our need for autonomy, so that's our free will. I do what I want and when I can do it. Our need for relatedness, which is about the quality of our relationships over the quantity. So do I feel seen? Do I feel witnessed? Um, do I, am I building you know, good bonds with people? and our need for purpose. Now, on the flip side, the things that make a game a game are these four game ingredients. So all games will have rules, feedback systems, goals, and autonomy opportunities. So the example I like to give here is that if, you know, many of you might have played Super Mario. Um, if I'm playing Super Mario, I can collect the coins if I want. I don't have to. And if I want to fling myself off a cliff, that's up to me because I have the autonomy to do that, okay? And obviously the feedback systems, there are how many coins did you collect, you know, and the purpose is about saving the princess. So if you think about a lot of the games you might have played in your life, you'll see that these four ingredients are at play. And the big aha moment for me was when I developed these two charts and just put them side by side. Because now we see that the very ingredients that make a game a game are what satisfy our psychological needs. And this is what makes games intrinsically engaging and in some cases addictive. So some of these overlaps are really obvious. So the autonomy opportunities I'm offered in games satisfy my psychological need for autonomy. And the feedback systems that games give me help me understand how well I'm doing and that satisfies my psychological need for mastery. And of course, the goals in a game satisfy my psychological need for purpose. But things like rules and feedback systems can combine to also satisfy my psychological need for relatedness. I feel seen, I feel witnessed, you know, I'm given a reward, I'm told how well I'm doing, but I'm also told where I can improve, how I can become stronger, how I can beat the bigger baddie at the end of the game. And to show how important all four of these game ingredients are in sa satisfying us for psychological needs, I just want to do a very sh small thought exercise with you. Okay, so when all four of our psychological needs are satisfied, that's when we're intrinsically engaged in the process. That's where things like flow start to develop, right? That's why some people can spend hours on end playing video games. But the moment I remove one of those psychological needs, the moment one of those psychological needs is not being satisfied, everything else breaks down. So all four are really important. So imagine that you're working 
that you have a great sense of progress and mastery, right? You have great relationships at work and your boss gives you regular feedback in reviews and so on. And you know what the company's vision is and you're working towards that. But your sense of autonomy is completely taken away. You're not allowed to carry out your work in the way that you want to with your own kind of creative flair and there's restrictions on how you work. You're essentially maybe being micromanaged. Then you will start to feel stressed and anxious. And that's actually one of the reasons why micromanagement is the most stressful thing in the workplace because it takes away your sense of autonomy and it impacts those other psychological needs. And so that's how... In, that's why it's so important to have all four game ingredients at play to satisfy all four psychological needs. And that's when intrinsic engagement happens, when psych those psychological needs are met. But don't forget that we don't just take part in games, right? We play games. And to play also has a relevant space in market research. Because when we play, we are being creatively engaged. When we play, we are able to express our true selves. And play also allows us to imagine ourselves in different scenarios in a way that feels safe. So maybe a future scenario, a different context. And actually we can induce a sense of play as I've seen in designing my research games all without the need for the metaverse. So earlier I touched on a study that was designed and then used on ASCIA and it was called, what kind of student are you? And this particular, let's call it a survey game, research game, whatever you want to call it, used some of those game ingredients. So the purpose of this game was to gain feedback about what kind of student are you. And you probably would have seen a lot of this kind of stuff on social media, you know, answer these questions and find out what kind of Disney princess you are and all this kind of stuff. It's a very simple way to use gamification techniques. And so that study ran for four years. That study, at its highest, had a 97% completion rate, which averaged over the four years to about 75%. We had over 17,000 participants, over 1,500 profile completes, and an average 70% start rate. So how many people kind of saw the first screen and pressed the start button? And even the client was really, as you can see on uh, the screen here, you know, um, the head of Insight kind of tweeting and putting on Facebook about this uh, survey quiz, getting people to take part. And for a while, it was the very first thing you saw on the University of Surrey's homepage. So some of the results from here show that there is a very high level of engagement just using, in all honesty, quite simple graphics, but using the understanding of gamification to drive that engagement. And as a result, my client and I, we got to present at IIEX um, about this as a case study. That was really good. And then they ended up winning an award for the study. So that's really cool too. But the most rewarding thing for me was the highlight of that intrinsic engagement happening. Participants voluntarily giving their feedback to say things like, thank you, to say things like, I, I would love to do more of these. And my client and I actually laughed when we read what's in bold here, adding a few more questions could improve it some more. By that point, Michelle and I had worked in research for a number of years. We'd never seen participants ask for more questions. There was no financial incentive given to the participants in the four years we ran that study because we invested in other types of value instead. We wanted to make it a research experience that was engaging and enjoyable. But what I've covered so far only covers the engagement aspect, right? What about that contextual stuff that I spoke about 12 years ago and that a lot of us in the room have spoken about and thought about today? I was working on behalf of a Fortune 500 portfolio beverage brand, who I'm not allowed to name. And they wanted to understand how bartenders would serve their particular spirit. Uh, that particular spirit has lots of different kind of ways you can use it in cocktails, but they wanted to know how bartenders in the real world are serving this. What are their serving suggestions? What are their ideas that maybe they can adopt in their marketing campaigns and advertising later on? And so before I started designing, I went to bars. There's not a running theme here, like the first picture with me with drinks, right? But I went to bars and I spoke to mixologists, people really proud of their craft. And I asked them, how would you serve this spirit if somebody came up to you and said, you know, make me a, a whatever the spirit is cocktail, right? And they said, well, this one guy went, well, it depends. It's like, depends on what? Well, 
you know, is it hot or cold outside? Um, is my bar really busy? Because if it's a really busy bar, I'm not going to suggest a cocktail that's going to take me five minutes to make. Um, is it a quiet time of day or not? And actually, is the customer looking a little bit older or a little bit younger? Are they male or female? All of these things, all of these variables had an impact on what kind of serving suggestion they'd have. This was great for me. Suddenly, the game architecture started to come to play. So the game idea here is that you own a bar. We're talking to bartenders, but you own a bar. You can name it what you want. Somebody's called it the artisan, you know, very East London, okay? But in this game, you have three levels in which the goal is to create a bar that has really good reviews. And you do that by serving cocktails to your four customers. And so I specifically chose these images of different people that were of different ethnic backgrounds. And you can tell that the two characters on one side are a little bit older, the two on the other side are a little bit younger, okay? And I split the way that these variables were laid out into three levels. So level one, it's the summertime. You start off serving a character in your bar and it's quiet, okay? And then in the evening, it gets busy. Level two, it's the winter time. So I, I, I created some audio and sound effects to make it sound like there was wind outside, but a crackling fire, really trying to immerse people in that idea that you're in a bar, but it's really cold outside and you know, sound effects of rain and all that kind of stuff. And level three is when a critic arrives at your bar and it's more of a kind of neutral time and you can make a serving suggestion that's in a kind of more neutral space. And every time you answer a series of que uh, uh, questions in a level, you get different achievements. So at the end of level one, you've gotten great word of mouth. That's great for your bar. Level two, great online reviews. Level three, the critic has reviewed your bar and it's in, in a local paper. And so, as you can see, these are really simple graphics, right? These are 2D images of, of 3D environments. They're not anything kind of like technologically out there. But you feel that you're talking to a person. You're having conversations. You're not necessarily even always asking questions. And so, one of my customers, Eric, comes to my bar and he says, I'd love a whiskey cocktail, something refreshing for this summer heat. So, I've got that sense that it's the summer, that's a variable that's coming into play there, and I've got a younger male customer. I go and I make my cocktail, and when I serve it back, I'm having a conversation again with my customer about why did I choose these particular garnishes? Why did I choose that particular syrup? And if I answer the open-ended questions, I get a gold shaker. So these are kind of like internal incentives. And those gold shakers, if you collect all six, become part of the critic review at the end. Very clever bit of design, I thought. And so I'll just play you some of the sound just very briefly here. I don't know if this will play. But if not, that's fine. Oh, no, okay, we'll leave that for now. Um, but basically, just again, thinking about things like sound, to have like this summer bar environment, you can see there's more people in the background, it's now quite busy, and we're now serving Moira. Moira's looking for something a little bit different. How would I serve her now based on what she wants? And there's a two minute timer that comes on a screen. Again, I make the cocktail and I go back to her. So what you've probably seen from a screen like this and a screen grab from Metaverse is that, flatly, it doesn't look that different. We're still talking to characters with pop-ups on the screen and things like that. And so I'm very much of the mind of if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? So if we've got the survey software that enables us to have context-led research that's engaging, we don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time and money worrying about what we need to do in the metaverse and if we need to use the metaverse at all. And so whenever I've made research games, one of the things I always do is create a story. So there we had that, you know, you're a bartender, you're running a bar. That's obviously not real. A lot of the bartenders that we would have spoken to don't own a bar. And of course, there's other research games I've made where you're transported into the future or you're um, an undercover agent. I'm just trying to remember some of the narratives that I've had. But sometimes you do need art and poetry and metaphors to help express and elicit the truth. And I think that until we can get fantastical, actually, with the metaverse, there's a lot of untapped insights. And so if we're looking at building engaging, context-led research, what kind of skills should we be looking for in researchers, whether we're looking to build these elements in or outside the metaverse? 
So although this stuff is online and digital and quants, if you like, quant data being collected, actually, I think we need more researchers who are doing quant work, but that get qualitative research and how that works. You need to know how to talk to people and engage people like you would in the real world to be able to translate that knowledge into a digital environment. So quanties who are staunchly quanties learn more about qual methods, run focus groups, do depth, depth interviews. We still need people who can write fantastic questionnaires. One of the last projects I worked on under the hat of research through gaming, I was consulting with a company whose questionnaire was quite frankly awful to read. Um, lots of ambiguity, typos, not very clear. And actually a lot of surveys are like that. Not all, but there's still a lot out there that are like that. So questionnaire writing is still a real skill that we need. We need creative people. We need researchers who can think like engineers and like artists. People who get storytelling, people who are problem solvers, and that needs a creative mindset as well. And people who are passionate about creating research experiences. Now, a lot of people here in the room have taken a survey and maybe don't think that this feels very experiential, but research can be a very rewarding and engaging experience that benefits everybody involved. But how do we develop those skills in market research? More courses, I think, from organizations that we know, you know, the SMRs, the MRSs, the ASCs, there's lots of them in this industry, thankfully. More courses in graphic-based questionnaire design. We're talking about worlds that are very visual. We need more researchers who understand graphic design and have that creativity. Maybe even have design-a-thons and competitions. Who can make the most engaging survey that gains great quality insight with the same research objectives? And let's showcase how customizable and creative existing survey software can be, just like I did when using ASCIA. And I'd recommend a lot of researchers attend non-MR events, go to tech conferences, go to design and UX conferences, go to the Gamification Europe conference. And when you're at an academic level, Teach the importance of participant engagement in research. There's a lot of students I've spoken to that really don't ever hear about, well, how do we actually engage participants? And finally, on your own, explore, design, fail, progress in developing your own skills. Like, have a go at developing what you think is an engaging survey. Rethink a questionnaire. See how you can make it more context-driven. So with that, thank you very much. And I will just leave you with this thought. Would Vegas have been as fun if it was in the metaverse? Probably not. <laughs>Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I definitely understand the use of gamification in research, especially in survey research, where we've seen item non-response and unit non-response uh, on the rise. My question is, in your opinion, to what extent is there a trade-off between gamification and data quality? Are we, to some extent, maybe trading accuracy, or to some extent, precision for entertainment and play? Um, interesting question because the role of gamification is to engage and the role of that engagement is to increase attentiveness and focus. It's not about fun. It's about engaging for all of those good outcomes that are useful in market research and insight. So I think this is sometimes where people have this misconception that gamification is just about making it fun for participants. It's about making it intrinsically engaging so that there is more attentiveness, a decrease in dropouts, an increase in completion rates. All of those things that are really important to us as researchers and, of course, our clients. And when participants are engaged, just like any of us when we're engaged in something, we are paying attention to maybe how we're reading a question and how we're responding or how we're responding to stimuli. So actually, there isn't a tra the trade-off is, is that you're investing in a gamified platform because of the better data quality and more trusted data that you will derive from that study. So think of gamification not as an element for fun, as a tool to sort out 
your engagement problem and get some context so you can understand the why of behaviours behind the what of how people have responded to a question. I hope that helps. Any final questions? Jerome, you're right at the back again. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to walk the whole way now. It's like a catwalk. <laughs> you are. I'm a big fan of gamification, and it's a great book you wrote. Um, Thank you. I think one of the, the things that, that's needed in survey research is the fact that right now it's a very solitary experience that to fill a survey. And I think in your game, it would have been so much better if you could have asked people to rate other people's cocktails. And if you can do that at the same time, in real time, then, then you're onto magic. And I think one of the success of Brain Juicer before they became System 1 and were less successful is, <laughs> is, is the idea they had where they had some open and you, know, you, could, you could pick the ones that other people had given and, and that would be like, you know, like that, that would really uh, make people think and, and it would be crowdsourcing ideas. Yeah. So what I think we really need is like uh, a ways of, of people filling surveys. It's not a question. Um, um, <laughs> of filling surveys at the same time. So they, 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 they know they're observed and, and that brings the competitive thing. And I'm, mm. I'm really looking forward to somebody, you know, trying to do that with Survey Pro or Askia or, or yeah. anything like <laughs> that. Thank you, Jerome. And although it was a comment and not a question, the classic, um, there, there is some, there is, there are so many different parts of games, right? So what I've spoken about today is like the four basic aim ingredients, but you've also got com competitive games. You've also got games that have bonus features. You've got games that got, have avatars, for example. As a designer, you need to decide what technique is useful and what can you do without to ultimately get to the engagement and quality insight that you need? So for that example, actually having other people rating your cocktails wasn't really relevant because we weren't looking for the crowd's opinion. We were looking about how would expert bartenders who have been doing that job, I think the quota was for at least seven years, what are their expert serving suggestions? But I get what you're, you're saying. But yeah, and that's where that kind of... Can we raise more designers and creative people who can think critically like this, who aren't just going to throw all the fancy stuff as a survey, but think critically, what techniques do I actually need here to get to the behaviours and the responses that are going to be useful to my client? But yeah, thank you, Jerome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you so much, Betty. I really enjoyed that. I'm sure everyone else did too. Um, I just think it's so interesting to see that intrinsic engagement actually not in, only impacts our consumers, but us within any industry, market research industry, be it you know a different industry. So thank you very much. Um, I'm hoping we can find, well, email you and find out where to buy your book so I can follow that up. And now I'd like to play a game. It is tea time. <laughs> We're going to have a quick break. Um, I'm not playing around, so I'll give everyone about half an hour. If we can come back for about three, let's make it difficult. Three, three thirty-one. <laughs> three thirty-one. I'll see you back. Thank you.